You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for June 17th, 2022. This week, statin intolerance, the external validity of trials, the IV contrast shortage, the expansion of cardiology into diabetes and nephrology. First, a quick correction. Last week, I mentioned a TRAVERSE trial, which is uh, looking at testosterone therapy and cardiovascular outcomes, and I said 500 patients. It's actually 5,000 patients. Okay, first topic today, statin intolerance. Two recent papers address the issue of statin intolerance, and one is a scientific statement on statin intolerance from the National Lipid Association, and the other is a newly published randomized N of 1 trial. The first thing to say about statin intolerance is that the issue transcends the simple but important matter of whether a patient takes a statin. Yes, of course, we should care about whether a patient takes a beneficial medicine. But the underlying themes here, causality, misattribution of causality, and nocebo effect lie at the core of doctoring. I'm especially drawn to the nocebo effect because, no doubt, words spoken in clinic or the hospital can harm and words can heal. Nocebo is the opposite of placebo effect. A super quick recap of the background on statin adverse events. Now, statins are the most studied medical intervention. Hundreds of thousands of patients have been randomized to statins or placebo. The drugs should not be thought of as cholesterol-lowering drugs. It's better to think of them as heart attack and stroke preventers. Now, there's a consistent 20 to 25% reduction of events on statins. And in all these blinded trials where patients do not know if they are on a statin or placebo, adverse effects are no different. In fact, a meta-analysis found that more patients in the placebo arm of these trials stopped the drugs for side effects. But in observational studies... Where patients don't know they are on statins, the rate of adverse effects is quite high, and the proportion of patients who qualify for statins do not take them is high, and up to half of all patients taking a statin end up stopping it after a year or two. Now, anyone who cares for patients knows that statin adverse effect reports are super common. Now, there are three possible reasons for this disconnect. One could be that the trials are wrong. I mean, run-in periods can screen out intolerant patients, and we all know trials enroll ideal, motivated patients. Now, another reason for the disconnect is that patients misattribute causality of their muscle pain. They think it is due to the statin, but it is really due to their diffuse arthritis. And the third possible explanation of the disconnect between trials and observational studies of statin adverse effects The most intriguing reason, I think, is the nocebo effect. That is, they expect the drug to cause them to feel unwell, and then they do feel unwell. The journal Circulation Outcomes has published a pragmatic N of 1 trial in which Oxford researchers studied the use of a behavioral intervention plus two types of N of 1 trials, and the idea was to help patients stay on the statin drugs. Now, first, a quick word on N of 1 trials. This is where the patient acts as his or her own control and active arm. Simply stated, one month on treatment, one month off treatment, and so on. I mean, we do this in regular practice a lot. We tell patients to try taking a med, then try stopping it, and then going back on it. I do it with antiarrhythmic drugs for benign arrhythmias a lot. The problem, of course, is to do a proper scientific N of 1 trial, You need a proper placebo tablet so as to ensure blinding, and you need a way to systematically record symptoms. Now, by the way, placebo tablets are very, very expensive and available only for scientific purposes. 
Of course, the This Week in Cardiology podcast has previously covered the incredibly smart Samson trial. This was led by James Howard at Imperial College London, which they had statin intolerant patients alternate months where they took the real statin, next month a placebo, next month no tablet. The patients felt best during the no tablet months, but had essentially the same side effects on placebo as they did on the statins. The conclusions were clear. The side effects were totally, utterly real, but they were due to taking a tablet, not the statin chemical. Essentially, it was all nocebo effect. But it's hard to do such a trial as it required an expensive placebo and an app to record symptoms. So what the Oxford researchers did, first author Dr. Kate Tudor, and they reported in CERC outcomes was something simpler, more pragmatic. Their RCT had three arms, about 93 patients in total. Now recall that N of 1 trials, you don't need as many patients because each patient is his or her own control. The first arm had 36 patients and they had behavioral counseling plus an unblinded N of 1 trials. They took the statin one month and they didn't take it the next. Unblinded. Arm 2 had 37 patients who underwent the behavioral counseling plus blinded N of 1 trials with a placebo. Here, one month on a statin, one month on a placebo. And arm 3, the control arm, had the usual care. Now, the behavioral counseling might be quite important. In this case, the doctor elicited participants' concerns about statins and sought to address these by positively endorsing the cardiovascular benefits of statins, explain their mechanism of action to create trust, and also the prevalence of adverse events in trials versus practice. Now, who were these patients? Patients in this trial were recruited by primary care physicians who had searched the electronic health record for patients with prior statin intolerance or patients who had previously declined statins in whom the drug was indicated, and then patients were contacted by letter. The main findings from this study were that investigators found that 71% of the patients who started uh, the unblinded arm completed the full six months versus 82% of the blinded arm. So pretty high percentages. Secondly, similar proportions of patients restarted the statin drugs after the trial in the blinded arm and unblinded arm, 46 versus 44%. And this was significantly better than those who restarted in the usual care arm. Only 20% in the usual care arm restarted statins. And so the authors concluded that an unblinded N of 1 trial approach with behavioral counseling can improve medication compliance when compared with usual care. Come on, this is provocative data. It's different from Samson, in which the investigators showed that statin intolerance stems from nocebo effect. Samson also found that about half the patients in their trial restarted statins. So on the surface, this trial shows that perhaps you don't need the more elaborate science of Samson, the, the blinding from the match placebo, the month of no tablets, and the app to record daily symptoms, which would be great. Just tell patients to try off and on months. doesn't matter why they restart statins. Ultimately, the goal is to lower their risk with these drugs. The problems here, though, is generalizability or external validity. You've got to always look at the trial flow diagram. This is usually figure one. Here, in this trial, they screened 700 to enroll 93, or about 1 in 8 patients. That, my friends, is a highly selective sample of motivated patients. Then, then all of these motivated patients got what sounds like an extremely supportive and time-consuming behavior intervention. Then, in this scenario, unblinded N of 1 trials seemed as good as placebo-controlled trials for the endpoint of starting statins. Now, I really love this type of work, but I concur with the editorialist that there are limitations in saying this technique will work in most patients with statin intolerance. That said, I see three take-home messages. First, clearly the adverse effect profile of statins are complex and the nocebo effect is strong. In other words, our words and actions matter. Second, many patients with statin intolerance can restart the statin. And N of 1 trials have great promise. And imagine a world, imagine a world, as the editorialists do, where we had an atorvastatin tablet with zero milligrams in which we could let patients do their own experiments. That would be amazing. By the way, I would love such a zero milligram beta blocker tablet because I strongly suspect that there is also a big nocebo effect there as well. 
All right, second top is external validity. I know this is awful jargon, but the concept is core to using evidence at the bedside. External validity speaks to the generalizability of the trial's result to the patient who is in front of you now. And a classic example is that of guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure. GDMT stems from trials done in mostly male outpatients with heart failure. These are patients who are well enough to walk into a heart failure clinic and participate in the demands of an RCT. The problem now, though, is that the profoundly silly quality measures urge clinicians to ignore external validity and begin these therapies in acutely ill, hospitalized patients who often have multimorbidity. I mean, one of the main goals of proper evidence-based medicine is wisdom in applying trial results. But here is the tension, right? From a scientific standpoint, trialists are often selective in their enrollment, which is fine. It's not bad. The goal is to define a population in which a therapy works. Having selected patients, selected protocols, proper controls, and robust follow-up works to make a trial cleaner. By the way, we call this internal validity. We can then say, for this population, under these circumstances, this tablet or surgery reduces this endpoint. Now, that makes things tough on us, the consumers of medicine, because it's hard to tell if the effect size seen within the confines of a trial apply to our, say, older patient who has tennis ball cutouts on her walker and advanced CKD. This is external validity. Now, pragmatic trials, like the one I just discussed for statin intolerance, study interventions more as they occur in the real world. They are designed to maximize external validity. This week, the story of oral nirmatrolvir plus ritonavir for the acute treatment of COVID-19 beautifully illustrates the concept of external validity. Note, I won't say brand names, even though it's easier, but you know what I'm talking about. Now, cardiology and EP especially has become acutely aware of this drug because hardly a day goes by that I am not messaged about whether a cardiac patient can take it. This is because nirmatrolvir plus rinovivir is a CYP3A inhibitor, and there are oodles of cardiac drugs that are metabolized via this pathway. Okay, in April of this year, New England published the EPIC HR trial and RCT of more than 2,000 patients who had COVID-19, pre-Omicron COVID-19, and risk factors for severe disease. And as the authors of the paper wrote, quote, of importance, this trial was restricted to unvaccinated persons. In these patients, in this setting, the drug crushed it. The incidence of COVID-19-related hospitalizations or death by day 28 was lower in the active arm than the placebo arm by 6.3 percentage points. Absolute risk reduction, 6.3. Massive, which was an 89% relative risk reduction and a very small p-value. So this was a huge effect size and statistically robust. All 13 deaths occurred in a placebo group. That trial was done in late 2021. But now, in the spring of 2022, the question became, who should get this drug? Would the drug have the same efficacy in vaccinated patients infected with a different strain of the virus, perhaps milder strain? Well, this week, Pfizer announced via press release that the EPIC-SR trial of nirmatrelvir plus rhinovir did not meet its primary endpoint of symptom alleviation. These were lower-risk patients, including those who had been vaccinated. Here were the key results. 0.86% in the active arm versus 1.7% in the placebo arm had hospitalization or death. This 50% relative risk reduction did not meet statistical significance. Now, given that the absolute risk reduction was less than 1 in 100, the effect size was likely not clinically significant, or at least a heck of a lot less clinically significant than it was in the higher-risk trial. Now, this is the same drug with the same pharmacology, but because the second trial enrolled patients who were lower risk, the clinical effect dropped substantially. The absolute risk reduction was greater than 6% in the higher risk group, and now it was less than 1%. The analogy I see is to ICD use. A defibrillator converts VF. Low risk patients can have VF. But we don't implant them in people with low risk because the benefits, the absolute risk reduction, would be so small that it is neither clinically significant nor cost-effective and harms what outweigh benefits. Please note here that I'm not trying to be an infectious disease doc. The specifics are not the point. The point is that we always, always have to think about how similar trial circumstances are to our patients, and it is not easy. 
Okay, third topic, contrast shortage. I've been reading a lot about the IV contrast shortage, but this week it came to Kentucky. Here in Kentucky, we're always late for both good things like bike lanes and bad things like contrast shortages. Now, the email from the cardiology leaders induced both concern, but also some topics of wide interest I wanted to share. Now, there's concern, of course, because contrast is incredibly important for many things we do. I mean, you can't easily fix STEMIs without contrast. But in the U.S., we massively overuse procedures and diagnostics that use contrast. So some of the suggestions that came through this email made me think. Here was one suggestion. Suspension of cardiac CTA for coronary disease. The comment was that we can do physiologic testing. Or the volume of contrast used for a cath is half of the volume for a CTA. It turns out that there remains great debate about the merits of functional versus CCTA, and even the CCTA proponents would concede that if there is a delta, it is small. Well, here's another suggestion. For PE evaluation, pulmonary embolism evaluation, start with a screening D-dimer. One of our PE experts at our hospital recommends that for these low positive D-dimers, say 0.5 to less than 1, we should move forward with a lower extremity ultrasound to look for a DVT, and then an echo for RV enlargement, strain, and elevated pulmonary pressure. And if this is positive and higher possibility of PE, then move to CTA. The third suggestion is one I will paraphrase. And it had to do with the fact that the ischemia trial came out in April 2020 during the peak fear of the pandemic. And it may have been missed. In so many words, the note writer encouraged all of us clinicians to revisit the delayed versus invasive trial of patients who had positive stress tests. Specifically, the supplement figure S6A in the New England Journal, which plotted the rates of cardiac angiography in the two groups. The delayed strategy of medical therapy first, then angiography only for recurrent symptoms, resulted in cath rates of about 25%. The invasive arm had angio rates of 90%. So the email message to clinicians was that in ischemia-like patients who have positive stress tests, quite positive stress tests, you get the same rates of major adverse cardiac outcomes over four years with 65% less coronary angiography if you use medical therapy first and reserve cath for recurrence. I want to now propose a thought. Let's say this shortage really hits hard and it persists. Of course, the sad thing about that is that there will be individual patients who will be harmed. But the provocative thought I want to raise is that, on average, will the changing norm of being more selective about the use of PE protocols, CAS after stress test, and CCTA over functional testing actually lead to better healthcare outcomes, or at least perhaps the same outcomes at less cost? Okay, final topic is a new statement on treatment of diabetes and CKD. And yes, this pertains to cardiology massively. Now, hear me out. During a recent ADA meeting, Joint Nephrology and Diabetes Scientific Statement strongly recommends elevating the SGLT2 inhibitor class to first line in people with diabetes and or worsening CKD. I totally support this notion. We in cardiology whether it's general cardiology or EP, we see bunches of patients who also have diabetes or CKD and are not on an SGLT2 inhibitor. I think we should take the lead and switch them. I've even begun to do that myself, at least in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, a side note here is that there was also an observational analysis presented at the ADA meeting that found an association of SGLT2 inhibitor use and less rates of atrial fibrillation. The news report from journalist and PhD Mitchell Zoller also notes other observational studies that find the same association. Now, the main barrier to the use of these drugs is not side effects but cost, and I don't have an answer to that problem because it is a policy issue, and I am a doctor, not a policymaker. Now, another suggestion from that same scientific document bothered me a bit, and I want to raise it here more as a question than a Mandrola proclamation. The document also urges rapid addition of the new non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist phenerenone for further renal protection. I want to pause there for a moment because I'm sure, I'm sure this new agent is going to be far costlier than the other two established MRAs, spironolactone and epilaronone. Here's my question. 
Finerinone was studied in Fidelio DKD, which was a placebo-controlled trial, 5,700 patients in New England Journal, diabetes, CKD, looking at a primary composite renal endpoint, and finerenone definitely did better with a statistically significant 18% reduction in the composite primary. Okay, that's great. Finerenone also reduced cardiovascular outcomes in patients with CKD and diabetes in the placebo-controlled Figaro DKD trial. This was a statistically significant 13% reduction in composite CV outcomes driven mostly by fewer hospitalizations for heart failure. Now, the problem I see for elevating this drug right away is that the control arm of these patients was placebo. The trials are fine for regulatory approval, but the question I propose is that would we get the same effect from less costly MRAs? Is it a class effect? And before using a super costly MRA, should we not have proof that it is superior to the other generic MRAs? Yes, I know that some will say that finerenone may be better tolerated or have less hyperkalemia. But, but, we must always remember that dollars spent on one thing can mean fewer dollars available for other things. Now, if there are any nephrologists who accidentally happened onto this podcast, please let me know in the comments of the heart.org Medscape Cardiology webpage. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened, and remember, Uh, This is a free podcast. If you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating. Write us a little review. These things really go a long way to helping others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.